Okay. So are we okay right now? Let me come back to the demo after, uh, let's just get this out of the way. So I was in the middle of trying to have a metadata activity storm going on with the code fives with a large slab, XFS statistics showing that it's all di directory information, using strace, using perf top, things like that to identify what's going on there. I want to go through this quickly, but we want to talk about file system components, allocation space, and explain what extent is, explain what allocation groups are, explain journaling, talk about fragmentation, and talk about some of the mount options. And we are already looking at log buffs, but we can't really up that anymore. So file system, automatically locating the data on disks. It maps the file name to a location. I don't want programs or programmers to have to worry about where to allocate it, <coughs> where it is on disk. And the whole purpose of the kernel is to make sure that two users or two programs don't allocate to the same space. So the kernel is going to organize and allocate data on the disks, hopefully in a contiguous fashion. File system is created on a partition or a logical volume. And we have what's called metadata. And metadata is the super blocks, the directory and inodes, and the basic data blocks. If you do a man on XFS underscore DB, this has notes on each structure and describes each field in things like the super block, the directory, or the inode. So I'm just showing a hierarchical file system tree concept here with things being mounted on it. File types, we've got regular, which are my files. How can we tell the file type? ls-l and the first field. So a regular is a dash, a d is a directory, a named pipe is a p. Things like pbs and qsub use named pipes. Character devices like terminals and tape is a c. Disk drives are things that are blocked and sectorized, or a B. For symbolic links, it's an L. And for network sockets, it's an S. And things like ArrayD use network sockets as well. So XFS is a standard feature in the SUSE kernel. For Red Hat, you have to have a kernel module. And SGI has our own uh, kernel module for RHEL XFS. And sometimes our XFS is a newer version than what you might get off of SUSE. Again, XFS supports spanning multiple devices. It's a journaled file system. Again, extended to was not journaled. FATS were not journaled. Uh, NTFS was a journaled file system. Extended 3 was a file journal file system. Again, the purpose of the journal is to protect the integrity of the file system tree. In the old days, I remember Craze used to take a couple of days to boot as they spent the entire time in an FSCK going through the entire file system A to Z. And it was big file systems. In fact, I remember when my son had a 100 gig drive on Windows and it was not a journal file system and it took a day for scan disk to go through that disk drive. So, number one, the journal tells me where I was in the file system mucking around, and by going to the journal, I can figure out where to start in my file system in terms of checking the integrity. Number two, the journal file system allows me to put the file back in the file system where it belongs versus a non-journal file system where it would go into lost and found. So my son's scan disk after a day had a lot of things in lost and found. So as these file systems get bigger and bigger, and the metadata file system trees get bigger and bigger, you have to go to journal file systems. XFS does support 64 byte file and inode capabilities, but that's not the default. You have to make it and mount it. And one of the key things XFS had was extents. Extents comes out of Berkeley. An extent 
is a contiguous piece of the file. Original Unix from AT&T was bitmap based. You had a bit for every file system block out there. Extents made it much smaller assets to describe the file and therefore less bit manipulation and less structure manipulation. Now one of the things that happened was uh, Red Hat and Extended 4 picked up XFS features. And one of the Extended 4 features is they went away from indirect block mapping into an extent list concept. They also did a few other XFS features such as delayed allocation and stuff like that. So Extended 4 is kind of taking the best of both Extended 3 and XFS. So to make the file system, I generally do a .xfs or .extended3. Uh, extended4 is not supported on SLES. Uh, there is a kernel module for it, but it is an unsupported module. And when I tried it last, it only worked on a read-only file system for SP2. But when I was in SLES 11 SP1, I could use Extended 4 as read-write, so I don't know what changed there. And again, if I have an external log, I've got to specify the log when I make the file system. So a 64-bit a file system with 32-bit, and I've got to double-check these numbers. I'm not sure they're accurate. But 32-bit gets me to a maximum of a terabyte file size and a terabyte file system. 64 bits then gets me to a 9 exabyte file, which is basically 9 million terabytes, or an 18 exabyte file system, 18 million terabytes. Uh, I don't really care about this, but sysctl has a couple of uh, IRIX behavior sysctl parameters. Uh, symlink mode determines where do I get my UMask from. Is it going to be from UMask? Uh, there's a uh, SGI ID inherit, and then there's also whether I'm going to restrict your own. Next couple of slides just show me my layers here. So I start off with a system call. If I am creating, just drawing, growing, or shrinking, I'm going to have to call this allocator, the space manager. So I've got a path here. This is going to be, if I do a write that's going to result in the disk file growing, then i got to call the space manager. If I just do reads or read, write, read, write on the same file and there's no size change in the file, then the uh, IO manager does not need the space manager, the allocator. Also, if I'm making or deleting directories, I have to do a space manager. But if I'm just touching the directory, if I'm accessing the directory, they don't result in allocation space changes, but they do result in file system tree changes. So the transaction manager is my journal. So if I, if I do not get journaling activity if I do read, 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 read. Okay, but I can get journaling activity from an LS or a find nowadays because access time on directories is now tracked. From there, then, we go into our page cache, buffer cache, volume manager, and disk drivers. And that just repeats three slides. So basic PCP, we do track the number of read and write system calls. Again, we're trying to deal with metadata here. So directories are containing the file name and a pointer to the inode. It's referred to as D entry underscore cache within the slab. You can watch it. And again, I didn't do it this morning, but SAR-V would show me how much directory entries are in memory. And again, a DF-I showing me what's out on disk. And this morning, I did pop up slab top to see that we had mostly inodes in that 30 gig slab. So here are the directory, D entry cache has an inode number and the file name. We don't put that in the inode because we need variable file name sizes. So it then points to the inode. And the inode has a variable part to the inode that could contain directory data, symbolic link, an extent list for the file, or the root of a B tree, the root of a file system. By default, I think this is still right, 256 bytes for an inode when we allocate it. 
When you get into things like DMF, they want to increase the inode size because DMF data is attached to the inode. So for directory information, we were seeing this with my XFS stats. We were seeing create lookups and creates. We did not see any removes and we did not see any LSs. So get DNS is saying I'm doing an LS or something. Find will also do get DNS. Then we got the inode or index node used to, to keep track of the position of the blocks on the disk. Again, there are two copies of the inode, one on disk and one in the slab. So with ls-l, df-i, and xfsdb, we can see what's out on the disk. And when we're in the slab, we had sar-v, we had slab top, and we had what's in proc slab info. Now I was a little surprised at this. I was seeing XFS AILs high, and I was not seeing XFS sync D or XFS log D. So I wasn't seeing a whole lot of flushing. But again, we were in makers, but I still had 30 gig of inodes in there. So again, a man XFS DB will tell you about the structure of the inode. So we've got the base inode fixed portion, we've got a data fork that's variable, and then we've got an attribute fork for file attributes. And this is just kind of drawing out an inode. The first thing we have is a magic, which basically tells me what this structure is. The mode bit and the format will tell me what variable, what I have in the variable part. User ID, group ID, number of links. We, XFS does support project IDs, including across NFS. Last time I accessed the inode, last time I changed the file, I'm sorry, last time I accessed the file, last time I modified the file, and last time I modified the inode. And this is also true for directories now. Size of the file, number of extents, So in PCP, in the procfs XFS stat file, I can see the number, and we didn't see much of this happening earlier, and it surprised me seeing so much inode data in the slab, but everything else was telling me I was directory intensive, not inode intensive. So inode, looking for inodes in memory, finding them is good. When I'm trying to manage and do garbage collection of memory, try to recycle the memory footprint for that thing, and the inode was busy. So that's a garbage collection failure because of busy inodes. I can have an attempt and it can be found or I can miss, miss being the number of times I went to disk for the inode. But there are times where I might miss it, but there's another duplicate of it in the cache. So even though I had a uh, 30 gig cache, that doesn't mean I have 30 gig of inode space out on disk because there is duplication and redundancy. This one, by the way, I have had problems with when I have a large cache. This is basically, again, garbage collection. I had one class where the system would stall out and we managed to correlate it to reclaims. That's, again, why I was trying to get a large slab to see if I could catch any reclaims. But I was not seeing it, I was only seeing directory, not data. And maybe I needed my uh, code fives to get further along past the actual creation of the data or creation of the directories and actually get to the creation of the data. Also, the number of times I change attributes. And then here's my flushing activity. Number of times inodes are being flushed. And we were not seeing any of that. And when I flush inodes that have changed, I try to group them together into a cluster. So clustering them is good. And then number of times I was not able to cluster the inode. And again, I'm using this data to characterize my metadata activity. Am I big on data allocation, deallocation, directory allocation, deallocation, inode allocation, deallocation, how hot the journal is, how hot the uh, buffer cache routines are. I'm looking for contention. We do have file attributes used to store metadata about the file. This is not the same thing as chatter. It is an ATTR, not a CHATTR. 
So there are some statistics to tell me about attribute information, get attributes, set attributes, remove attributes, and list the attributes. Next, we have to worry about allocation groups. So remember, in my example, we had four uh, stripes. We had 32 allocation groups from XFS underscore info. That means we've got eight allocation groups. Well, actually, this wouldn't be true. I need to be in a concat rather than a stripe. So those 32 allocation groups are spread across the four stripe objects that we have. So we've got 32 allocation groups. And every time I do a make dir, or also if I a fold allocation group, I'm going to rotate to next AG. Now, I do not like the allocation groups to get too big. If I get, or I should say, too many allocation groups. If I get too many allocation groups, the allocation groups are going to get too small. And then when I run out of space, I don't find it in an allocation group, and then I end up going around to all my allocation groups. So if I had 100,000 allocation groups, and they're real small, I'd spend a lot of time going around trying to find contiguous space. More allocation groups allows more concurrent metadata changes. So each allocation group has its own set of metadata, but it is locked. We can change that metadata only one thing at a time. It is serial locked on a per allocation group basis. So if I have four files growing at the same time, and they're all in the same allocation group, they can only toggle or interleave between the four in their growth. They cannot do it in parallel because only one of them can lock the structures to do the growth at a time. If I spread those four files each into their own allocation group, then I have decoupled the metadata and all four files can grow concurrently at the same time. So more allocation groups allows more concurrent metadata changes assuming the distribution gets me to a different allocation group. So at the top of each allocation group is my metadata. I start off with the super block. And then I've got an allocation group free blocks and an allocation group inode B tree. So this is pointing to the inodes. And again, a B-tree is a search algorithm. I like to compare it to a sign at the fork of the road so I know which road to take. We also have a free list of free disk space. Now, there are two B-trees for free space. One is by block number. One is by block size. This is to find largest size closest to me. In other words, we're trying to avoid fragmentation by having two B trees. So finding the largest size close to me by saying, okay, I've got uh, where I am in head positioning here and where I am in sizes. And that's to avoid some of the fragmentation. So in a super block, we have things like the file system allocation block size, number of blocks, and you were able to catch the fact that the blocks within the file system are not in 512-byte box, but they are in block size. And unfortunately, we're limited to page size or stripe width. And x86 is a 4K byte page size. Where is the log? Uh, things like that, number of inodes, so forth. So this is just talking about a B tree, which is a search list. And then our allocation of our inodes. Our inodes are allocated in chunks of 64. When you have a default 4K byte block and a 256 byte inode. And these are all packed in consecutively. They're not scattered around. 
So here's what I was talking about. We rotate allocation groups. Files and inodes, when we get to a new directory, the files and inodes may be clustered around the directory. Now that changes depending upon your file system. Now here's what I was talking about in a Stripe volume. So we had, in our case, we had 32 allocation groups spread across the four drives in my Stripe group. So as we're doing round robin, we're still in the Stripe group, but we're getting distribution across them. But if I can cat and Stripe, so here I'm going to get my allocation groups on the first. If, if I was, if my four wide stripe was actually concatenated four wide, and I have four concats, that would have meant I had eight allocation groups per concat. And this is another way, instead of striping 32 wide or 64 wide, I can stripe four wide or eight wide and then concatenate them and use allocation groups to get to the next concat object. Now, I uh, had a site that had a problem because their allocation group's num number or count was so large that it took a day for them to rotate from one allocation, from one concat to the next concat. And that's where that skip AG can come in play. So I could have a lot of uh, AGs, but rotate through them quicker. And I want it odd. That way, when I rotate around, I don't come back to the same allocation group. So if they were, if my skip was odd, I'd go one, one, one. But then because of the, you know, I'd go one. If it was a three, I'd go one. And then I, I would have a rotation pattern that would bring it back. But you're trying to get a scatter rotation and interleave pattern such that when you wrap back around, you end up on the second allocation group. This is what I was trying to get to now. When you're less than a terabyte, 32-bit, the inodes and the directories are near the file. Trouble is, when you're mixing small and big files, this is going to result in fragmented files. This was good when we were in, you know, a, a, 10 gig drives and stuff like that, but now that we're into terabyte drives and we get larger than two terabyte, we still got the directory and the inode close to each other, but now the file data is separated off into a different region. We no longer try to keep them together. The original thinking was, once I find the inode, I want the file closest to it. But when we were getting into terabyte files, that resulted in fragmentation. And there's something called rotor step. So rotor step says how many files in my directory before I rotate to the next. Uh, I do have a line wrap going on here. Your, your artwork, your hard copy should be a little bit better. But this one was a uh, greater than two terabyte inode 32 with a rotor step of three, which meant I got three files in the allocation group before I rotated to the next allocation group. I myself would prefer to keep my rotor step at a one. I don't really want to group them together. I suppose there are cases where you do, but if I want four files to be able to grow consecutively, I don't want to rotor step them and put three into the same. That's where skip AG comes in to allow me to get them out of that allocation group. So we do have file system allocation metrics, number of extents that are allocated, in other words, number of contiguous pieces, number of blocks, extents freed, blocks freed. And then we've got B tree lookups, how, how much work am I doing to find allocation space? And again, I don't use these much, engineers may, but uh, I only care about it if it is way out of range or an unusual number. Same thing with these. I'm not really using these, but number of block map, reads, writes, deletes, inserts, and then number of extent list deletions, extent list compares, extent list lookups, and then also our block map B tree lookups, compares, insertions, and deletes. 
but I'm not, I'm not going to generally use those. These are relevant though, number of bytes processed by the XFS daemon, number of contiguous buffers processed, and number of non-contiguous. So with XFS info, again we talked already that these blocks are in blocks B size. Now it was nice in older releases with Itanium that we could go up to a 64K byte, but we can only go up to page size or stripe width. So again, here I got eight allocation groups. Again, the size of these in blocks is in 4K. And I don't see any striping in this one. This one happened to have an allocation group of 22. No striping again. And both are internal logs. And we don't care about real time. So journaling, file system operations, that's what I was trying to drive was the uh, XFS information. Traditional method of metadata changes in FAT in NTF or uh, extended to was ordered synchronous updates and a repair after a crash required an entire metadata scan, which was very time consuming on large file systems. So then we went to a transaction base where we have a collection of metadata changes and then turn that into a single logical file system operation. That's what the log buffs was and log buff size. So there's an in memory a buffer to keep track and pool these transactions before they're written to disk. And again, with XFS, we were limited to, what was it, 32 or 8 on extended 3 and 4. There is no limit. It can use all of the memory and it is counted as buff mem or raw I.O. So once we've grouped these transactions or grouped these uh, uh, ch metadata changes together into a transaction, we then write that transaction off to the disk buffer and then the file system is coherent or consistent. So a log is an ordered collection of transactions. It's a circular list. If you're heavy metadata intensive, you might need a larger buffer and a larger log to be able to keep track back far enough. And fixing a file system occurs on the mount. XFS repair is, is a last resort. The repair happens when I do the mount. And the mount will look at the journal and say the journal, my file system was not played, or my file system was not shut down cleanly, which means the log is in an un, unspecified state. So for recovery, we replay the log on the mount. And I have had cases where a mount may take 10, 15 minutes. I should have seen what, uh, oh geez, what's going on here? Uh, my K dump doesn't seem to have worked here. Hang on a second. I'm going to jump away from the uh, lecture here for a second. Because I had a large metadata activity and stuff, I was concerned about what was going on here, but my K dump never finished here. So I'm going to hit an escape, shift, Q, or sorry, control right bracket Q. And I'm going to do a power NMI on P3. And then let me go back to the console. Debugger re-entered on CPU 7. Strange CPU 7 should not be running. Cannot recover. Not fun. So I'm not able to get a K dump on that thing. So let me just try a power NMI one more time. And it's pretty dead. So 
So I'm just going to do a power reset on P3. Now one of the problems I have here, the timestamp on Floyd 3 was wrong. I wanted to actually time and see how long it took for the mount to occur on the reboot. Since we did take a service interruption, it is a good example for the XFS log and see what happened to that slash scratch file system where all the code files were running. So let me just see if that snapped it out. I do see the uh, resets come in. I'm just going to break out of there for a second. UVCon to uh, R1, I1, B's, one, two, three. I think it'd be four. Let me just check config dash V. I want, yeah, four. And I'm just checking the BIOS as it's booting. Just give me a minute, we'll go back to the uh, slides here. I was interested to see how long it takes to boot this system with a corrupt heavy metadata file system. Okay. There's also a uh, control right bracket Q. I do a watch BIOS dash S. And I can see it's now finding FV booting. The other uh, blades will be in a sleep handoff state. So this is just showing the subroutine in the BIOS that that particular uh, BMC or that particular blade is at. So I should see the console come up here in a minute. There we are. Let me just see what I've got. Yeah, it is plus 11 SP2 as a default boot. That is the UV kernel. That's what I wanted. The kernel I'm using is as of last week, but it looks like I've got a couple of, I've panicked it three times so far. Oh, what was that? That's okay. So this is directly related because I'm talking about journals and I just had a heavy metadata journal problem that panicked my system. So the journal was not cleanly shut down, was not replayed, therefore on boot it's going to say problems with it and it's going to have to do a file system integrity check using the uh, journal to recover things. And there we are, recovering journal, SDK2, that's my root. But that's not the one. Oh, SDK2. Those orphans are on my root. So my root had problems as well. Oh, by the way, don't worry about this. I have a PV on this. These attaches are for the K worker threads. Don't worry about them. So don't care. I do have a PV on it. And now we're on the XVM.
Oh, it recovered fairly quickly there. And remember, root was extended three versus XFS. Well, I'm just going to let that go. I wanted to see how long this took. Seems to be stuck on starting MD right now. I didn't even have any MD there. I'm almost wondering, there we go. No LVM. Oh, look at, see that ending recovery? So that pause that we had was the recovery for that uh, XVM file system. So even though I saw starting MD raid, that wasn't what I was spinning on. It was on the recovery of the mount. Okay, let me go back to the uh, presentation for a minute. So I just wanted, I was actually there to look at this mount after what had happened there. So these journal transactions, it's an asynchronous log. We have two parts, in-core log buffs and on-disk log. The circular log on disk is always written. It's only read during a recovery. Recovery reads the on-disk log and replays it, the on-disk journal. It's the mount that calls the recovery code. XFS repair is a last resort to repair the file system. An unmount prevents a replay of the log, so we have a clean unmount. And I was wondering, in my case, if I had done a shutdown, how long it would have taken to unmount and handle that 30 gig of metadata that we had. And I may try to set that up tomorrow. So you have multiple in-core log buffers. Allow for transactions when another buffer is being written. The transactions are committed to the in-core. This was the no IC logs. But with the latest kernel, it is, it is max by default. So I can't change it anymore. So uh, just doing real quickly here, make FS with the external log. I'm not going to demonstrate that today. Ran out of time. And then here's where I were. So we have number of transactions waiting to be committed, asynchronous transactions, and transactions that did nothing. Number of log buffer writes, number of log blocks written. So this is the memory to disk. And then here's the one we were seeing, log entry attempt during a memory flush. And again, having more buffers allows me to interleave. But if you remember, the W chain on those code files is also indicating uh, XFS waiting for a log. And then we have what I called an action item list. And we were seeing the AIL, AIL daemon pretty high there. An action item list is metadata where the log write has occurred, but the metadata itself is not flushed to disk yet. And because we had a 30 gig slab with a lot of makers going on, we were having a large AIL list to be able to get that stuff synced together. For the log, by default, it is in the middle of the drive. I did have people that would make the log external but put it in the middle of the drive still. The interesting thing about that scenario is Networker would fire up two threads so each of the partitions on each side would have a separate I.O. thread versus this one where it'd be just one I.O. thread. I would never really put the log at the beginning of the drive. And I think it was Carlos that we were talking about yesterday, zone bit drives. Zone bit drives have a different geometry depending upon where you are in the drive. 
And I never trust FDISC or PARTED for geometry information because they don't know how to handle zone bit drives. I never trust it. I go back to the technical specs for the drive. So the reason I'm saying I don't want the drive at the beginning of the drive, the beginning of the drive, block zero, is the outer tracks of the drive. Bigger circumference, more sectors per track. As I go towards the center of the drive, circumference goes down, less sectors per track, less bandwidth. So I'm not trying to put it at the beginning of the drive because that's the bandwidth portion of, of the drive. And the journal is small IOs and I don't need bandwidth. So by moving it to the end of the drive, I am leaving the bandwidth portion of the drive open for things like slash video. And again, I might go to a separate drive like I did in this case. First of all, I have to have a hot enough log to require the separate drive, like bar spool MQ for a mail server. But the trouble is, what do I do with the rest of the drive? I don't want to put all my logs on the same drive. That would be real bad as well. So I had Los Alamos that has done that and put all their external logs in one drive. All it would take is activity to one of the file systems or metadata storms of one of the file systems to impact all the logs that are out there. So the problem with going to an external drive is what do you do with the rest of the drive? Again, a lot of people are not bothering with external logs. Again, the journal, when it's a version two, is in the middle of the Stripe group. Now, ironically for me, and I need to look at it more, the first drive of the group, or one of the drives of the group, seemed to be higher. So you had one that was like at 60% and the others that were at 40%. So I had a four strike group, but one of them seemed to be hotter, and then the other three were behaving as a single drive. I'll try to see if I can spot that again in demo. So here's that XFS stat script. There is a version in CXFS as well, but this one came from me. Again, looking at this, uh, allocation, allocation, but look at the metadata. I'm doing a lot of directory lookups, not a whole lot of creates, not a whole lot of removes, but a lot of LSs it looks like, or a find type of command. Some transaction activity. Here's uh, inode finding, looking for inodes the number that were found and the number that were missed. So most of my inodes were not in memory. And this one is a bad one, inode reclaims. I wish I had the size of the slab in this example. Also, I do have a lot, lot of uh, log activity going on and I do have no IC logs happening here. I do have those AILs going on, but they weren't as bad as what we were just looking at. Here's my read and write system calls. Here's my inode flushing activity. This is clustering. It looks like I've got more that are not clustered than those that are clustered. And then I got V nodes, and what's missing in this report, we now have buff underscore that are not showing up in this report. This is an old report. And again, PCP can get to the same data, but IC logs is important at five, but that would get buried by this one here that's up at nine million, or this one here that is at 74 million. So you don't really want to put these all on one chart. So when I make a file system, I've got my block size. Unfortunately, we can't increase it because we're limited by page size at 4K bytes. Then we got allocation group count. So if I have a lot of metadata or file system growth activity, I may want to separate them and have more allocation groups. Some people actually were going with odd allocation groups, just like I mentioned having odd skip AGs. Again, that's to try to get a, a padding that causes a skewing among these allocation groups and to skew them among the physical ones that are underneath it. But I don't want to get my allocation group count too big or my allocation groups will end up too small and the allocator is going to 
when it can't find contiguous in a group, it's going to go on to the next allocation group. And if I've got a lot of allocation groups, suddenly I'm spending all my time checking all these allocation groups for contiguous space, and that would be bad. One of the things that I miss from Cray days, Cray disk usage would actually give me a histogram of how many files are in each memory or file size bandwidth. So I could run this command and say, tell me how many files are smaller than a meg, how many files are greater than a terabyte, and be able to get a histogram to understand the size of the files and also the age of the files. And I don't have anything like that these days. Also, again, when I'm making a file system for inodes, I can change the inode size, primarily DMF to increase the inode size. In older days, they used to put the, not XFS, but AT&T file systems, they used to put the file right in the inode. So increasing the inode size would allow me to actually store a small file in the inode and not have to look at that. XFS does not keep data in the inode not keep the actual data itself. This was what I was hitting with max percentage and DF-I showing that. And you can also align your inodes. And right now my inodes, I believe, are aligned. But that's why I was wondering why one drive was busier than the others, thinking that it was inode activity going to that particular drive. And also when I made the file system, I had the option, but I don't really have any choice here because I'm limited to a 4K byte size, but I would have been able to increase the directory allocation size different than the file system size. But since we're limited to 4K, that doesn't help me at all anymore. So block size recommendation, you do now have a mount option for stripe width allocation. 4K byte was the default. So if I'm doing large sequential video, I can go into a stripe width allocation. The purpose of going to larger block sizes was to reduce the fragmentation, often increased in the video markets, and the dash N was meant for small files with large directory counts, particularly it was for email spam attacks and stuff. But again, I don't have the option anymore because 4K is the largest I can go to. The problem if I make my allocation unit too big is if I'm doing four byte or you know one K byte files and I maybe in the old days had a 64 K byte allocation unit, I would end up wasting a lot of space. So when my block size was too big and my files were small, I would end up wasting disk space. So anyway, this is the important part. We can't really control a lot of the uh, block size or stuff anymore, but an extent, a file extent, there is a XFS BMAP command that can show me the extent list. Older file systems from AT&T were bitmap for every block. This now is saying offset logical into the file. Where does it start on the logical file system and how big is it? So I'm looking at a file here, a video clip. It had four extents. The, this is the logical offset into the file. So the first uh, 46377 blocks were at 636. Then the next set of extent dropped down to 352. Then the next extent went up to 551. And then the next extent went down to 12,000. So we do have a fragmented file that is actually scattered on the platter. This is a lot more likely when I have uh, small allocation groups or allocation groups that are filling up. Now, it's not documented well, but XFS BMAP does have the ability of two Vs and even three Vs. So when I use two Vs, I get the extent list, the offset, the block range, but I now know which allocation group it was in, the offset into the allocation group, and again, the total size of that extent. And if I go to three Vs, I actually get flags here that tell me whether it is aligned or not. 
So a 1-1 one, one is saying it doesn't begin on stripe width, it doesn't end on stripe width. So these were not aligned. So we're talking about fragmentation. No matter what you do, fragmentation is potential there. I don't like to keep my file systems full. I said earlier like 75%, here I'm saying 90%. It really depends upon how big your files are and how big your file system space is. You know, if I'm a 160 terabyte file system and my files are in the terabyte range, I'm going to want more headroom to avoid fragmentation. So again, don't run file systems full. Use DMF to offload that stuff. Some sites will copy to an empty file system. So they'll have a slash work per job. And then when it's done, it might copy it to slash archive. And slash archive has DMF running. So slash archive would have lots of space available. And then it would get copied unfragmented. And then DMF can offload it. Now we do have fragmentation statistics. I got to warn you, uh, System Info Gather had fragmentation statistics in them, and that can take a while when you are in a large inode directory count. So there is a frag f for file fragmentation and a frag d for directory fragmentation, and also a free SP that tells me what kind of free spaces. Do I have lots of little free spaces? What's the histogram on free space sizes? And again, for fragmentation, there is the defragger. You, in XCXFS, you run the defragger only on the metadata server. And this XFS FSR is in the XFS dump RPM, which was not loaded by default. We just saw that. So here's an XFS DB. Did a free space showing me my number of extents and given sizes. So it looks like most of my extents are in the one megabyte range. Then I did a frag dash D. Now these will not match exactly. I've got a 10 year old PV on this one. So this is the, uh, what we got here? This is the total objects that it look at, but it won't match DF dash I, for example. And in this case, ideal saying I have, I should have 12,398 directories. Let's see. No, I'm sorry. I, I mixed up. That's me. I'm screwed up here. Not thinking right. So this is the actual, this is what I have. So I have 45,966 directories that it saw, but that's not going to match. Uh, DF, for example. Of those 45,000, 12,000 are contiguous and not fragmented. So 73% of my directories are fragmented. Notice I was running this on a, on a bar spool news file system. Then when I went and actually looked at files for fragmented, I have 2 million files here, and most of them are ideal, giving me less than 1% fragmentation on the files. Mount, so when I mount, I got to have a log desk specified if it's external. If I'm doing quotas, I can do quotas without actually enforcing it. And S SGI's XFS has quotas by project ID, which we also use on ICE lead nodes to protect compute nodes from each other. So there's a whole bunch of mount options. Again, these are pretty much meaningless now because they default, they're already at their max based upon the man page. And again, cat proc mounts. For actual, even if not in FS tab. I can turn alignment off. If I'm a web server, I might want to turn access time tracking off. It does take time, and this stuff will result in the slab being used to bring that stuff in. So I can reduce that, for example, on a web server. 
And this one is fairly new. This started with SLUS 11, where it actually started working. In older days, an LS-R or a find was not modifying the directory access time. And then I started running a class with a find running, and I had a huge slab, and it took me a long time to reboot the system. Here's the skip allocation group to get a skew between the allocation groups. NFS right synchronous is going to be a performance degradation, but a reliability issue. We can mount with stripe width. There's one to whether I'm going to cluster the inodes on the disk or not. Uh, generally, I'm not advising changing the hash table size unless engineering says so. And in general, we now do have to have write cache enabled for the journal, and barrier is quite common. There is a no large I.O. one that affects the stat block size for an application that says, what file system block size do you have? Because the application then used to be a multiple of that. <coughs> so I got mount options documented there. There are disk quota statistics in XVM, or, or for XFS, I mean. Not really caring about those right now. The lab had you grow a file system. Uh, Carlos, did you ever get to actually finishing the XVM lab? I didn't. Just wondering. No, I, didn't, I, I didn't finish it, but. Yeah. So there's a point where you uh, uh, stripe four more slices, uh, attach them to the existing stripe group. You've got to insert a concat to do that. Then when you come out, you do your grow FS, and then we can see the file system growing. There are a whole bunch of sysctl parameters. Uh, rotor step we talked about, we talked about those. I really do not adjust these three. I adjust them on the flush demons, but not on XFS. And there are some other sysctl parameters. Reclaim greater than a certain seconds. In other words, we're calling shrink decache pages. And here, number of free inode entries, prune the inode list. Some of these are real old. And then documented them. Uh, making a RAM file system. In particular, here's what I was talking about. When I mount the dev shemem, I can specify how big it can get. And this was the important one to reduce my memory pressure. And for this is for IPCS. The Shem All, which is basically unlimited right now. And then uh, we're not talking huge pages here, but there's a huge page file system concept. I do have a lab for that. Here's what Code 5 was it's basically a postmark stress test. And a whole bunch of references here. I don't have it here. There is a uh, XFS website out there. SGI had one internally, but that's obsolete. Uh, let me make a note of finding where that thing is nowadays. I'm just going to Google it. So I'm hoping that you understand Superblock Directory and inodes. Again, XFS underscore DB. Let me see if I can find it here for a second. Yeah, the... Uh, the web page is www.xfs.org. And they do have a lot more information on the internals for the file system and how it's built. There is an older one under oss.sgi.com, but that is real old. And they do have a XFS user guide there. They do have XFS training labs that we did a long time ago when we trained the uh, uh, XFS developers for Novell. Uh, 
a description of runtime stats. Let me just share my desktop here. So I was in the XFS.org. Let me just go back here. And I went to papers and documentation. There are training labs, but what I went for here was the XFS stat information. And then it's describing each of the structures that we were in my own XFS stat. So here it's actually laying out the fields that are there. And most of this description stuff is straight from PCP and the engineers. Where it was the uh, AIL. And here they're really not giving much description of these, just saying here's the field that that thing is uh, tracking. And there used to be a script. Yeah, they have their own xfsstats.perl script now. I have not actually used that thing. I've got my own right now. So you might want to grab that and try that. And file system structure looks a little old. Let's take a look at the journaling log. It doesn't even have much there yet. So there's a little bit there. There is some stuff on, uh, let me go to oss.sgi.com. Project list, XFS, uh, publications, I think I want uh, publications, oh they've even, they now redirect it straight there. Uh, There used to be some uh, training documents there. Let's see what this is. Yeah, here, here's the older. They've taken it off and redirected it to the org site, but this is the original OSS site with the labs. This was the training material done for Novell back in 2006. And if you go into internals in here then, this was actually from Cliff Wickman going through all the individual structures and getting into some links and stuff like that. Cliff Wickman used to be a trainer and this came out of his materials. He's now a uh, course developer. Uh, let's see. I think I want to take a short break here. So we were looking at uh, the file system tree, looked at documentation, talk about the layers, metadata layout. Again, that's what I was trying to point to with XFS DB. Know what a super block directory and inode are, allocation groups, allocation within a stripe, concat, or combination. I think we're okay with making an XFS file system. There was a lab to grow it. XFS info to figure out how it's built. Then explaining some of the MakeFS options. We looked at statistics for it. We really skipped over attributes. I don't use rotor step. I don't really want to group them. I'd rather spread them across. I was trying to demonstrate the effect of journaling here. And we did see the mount repairing things and how it was handled differently between extended three. I wonder. There's CD slash lost plus found should not be there. I went to Floyd three. Remember we saw those orphans and they are not in the lost and found. So they were put back in the file system tree or removed. Again, uh, Floyd 3 has been built with an external log. 
We talked about when I need an external log and where to put it, and the journaling statistics in XFS. Uh, journaling, that doesn't really help us anymore these days because our block size is still 4K. Determine the best block size. We can't do anything except SW alloc. We talked about an extent and boundary alignment. That's what I need to demonstrate now. I'm going to take a break. We looked at XFS BMAP, XFS DB, uh, XFS FSR. I don't think this is a command. And again, that code 5 was postmark running. So we're able to mount a file system and edit FS tab. Anyway, those are the types of things that I'd like you to be comfortable with. Let's take a 10-minute uh, break, come back at 20 after the hour. Okay.